so I, I want to talk about digital transformation in the HSE, and the HSE traditionally has been seen as like a super tanker, very slow to change, but I think there's a new HSE emerging, and in the crisis that we have in, in front of us, I, I think for, you know, our CEO, Paul Reid, has is inspiring confidence in, in terms of the approach, but I, I think everybody will see actually a new, more agile HSE than you've ever seen before, and digital is a key part of that. So I have more slides than I have minutes to talk, so I'm going to move quite quickly, but hopefully some of the slides will leave impressions uh, with you that will, will help uh, us all work together to actually deliver a, a better national uh, health service. So we're going to talk about how to scale innovation faster for patient and population benefit and digital transformation at HSE. Uh, over 150 years ago, Abraham Lincoln said, the dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. I think we'd all agree, actually, this is probably as relevant, if not more relevant, uh, today uh, than when it was uh, said 150 years ago. And this is uh, a headline from 6 a.m. this morning, 33 cases of coronavirus are confirmed on the island of Ireland. Uh, no doubt, actually, the, probably the number is more. It's a rapidly um, evolving and unprecedented situation, as our CEO, Paul Reid, has said. But in this, there is the opportunity for digital. Uh, Francesca Colombo, who gave a talk here a couple of months ago, and I know Ronnie, she's a, a past associate of you, she talked about healthcare being uh, 10 years behind uh, all other industries in terms of digital transformation. And there's been a, a recent uh, report from the OECD, Healthcare in the 21st Century, that clearly positions Ireland really as a laggard uh, behind the European peers. We're probably five years behind the broader industry. Uh, but we can make progress uh, fast. I was speaking to George Crooks uh, a couple of weeks ago. He leads the Digital Care uh, Institute in Scotland. And he said, actually, we'd love to be in Ireland's position. I asked why, and he said, because you're so far behind and you can take advantage and, and leapfrog using some of the new technologies that are available. Um, in this, the digital transformation function, which is a small function within the HSE, this is kind of the, the central premise of what we do in an unstable complex system, which is the national health system. Small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. So small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. And I want to give you some, some examples um, of that. So this is the way, actually, today HSC are recording um, COVID information. And there have been several um, interventions or several iterations of this form. And our challenge was to actually go from something like this to, to move to something like this. So we started last Wednesday to talk with the, the clinical lead for the national, uh, for, for primary care and he was talking, wouldn't it be better if we had you know, some sort of app? And the, the HSE tends to outsource a lot of software. Uh, so the initial feedback from some of the big iron companies um, in Ireland was about three weeks to develop this app. So I picked up the phone to one of my team, a guy called Ross Cullen um, in Galway. And within two hours, he actually had the prototype app. The following day, he actually uh, had this fully digitized. And, and here's the application. It's, it's, it's very simple. So for the HSE to take, you know, just two days, 48 hours to, to move from actually manual recording to, um, you know, actually d d digitized recording, I think is remarkable. Now, what we're trying to do, we have to industrialize this. Um, so a guy called Tom Laffin is working to actually uh, integrate this and other components so we, ha we can have a system that can scale at in in industrial, um, you know, uh, level. Um, here's a, another application that is being developed by uh, a company in Ireland, Digital Hope. They've specialised in caring for um, post-lung transplant uh, patients, but they also pivoted. You know, last Wednesday this didn't exist, and Eamon Costello, the CEO uh, of Patient Empower, he gave me a call. I, I think we have, we might have something uh, that could help here. So the strategy, as you know, is you know, deploy home or ha to have people at home that have mild or moderate symptoms and to use an app to actually manage them uh, remotely. Uh, so there's a, a process, the patient is first registered by the clinical team and receives an email or SMS to set up the account. They complete registration. Um, now it turns out this is um, a uh, pulse oximeter, and it turns out this is the thing that is most critical in terms of managing patients that have COVID-19. WHO have done a study, and they've looked at 40,000 data points from patients, 45,000 patients um, in, in China, 
and the pulse oximeter or the saturation level, the oxygen saturation level is the number one sort of indicator when things are getting bad. So if your oxygenation level drops between, below 93%, then you need to be hospitalized. So the idea is, uh, and you know, they have built sort of an application um, which um, allows real-time collection of the oximetry uh, reading, and then it is posted to a clinical portal. So I'm going to do a live demonstration. So the, the HSE, we normally take a year to build an app, but I, I just picked up this uh, device on my way to the presentation here. It just shows how quickly can, you can move if you have you know, agile partners working with you. So um, this is the, the app. This is a pulse uh, oximeter. It's something that you would see in any hospital. It's now turning on. It's checking my uh, pulse, and I'm, I'm going to um, ask it to take a reading. So it's now waiting for a connection. You know, you can see here it's showing 97%. And so it's now taking the measurement. It's reading the measurement from the oximeter. And there it's showing actually, obviously my pulse is a bit high because I'm nervous presenting it, it's 113. <laughs> but my, um, the saturation, the oxygen saturation is 97%. So this is a technology that you know, didn't exist last Wednesday and is now available and we have a, a crisis management team that will be making a decision after, uh, this afternoon how this can be integrated into the model of care. So we met earlier this morning with Siobhan Nibreen who runs, the, the, she's the lead for integrated care. And she's very much on board and thinks this can be a very, you know, powerful response uh, to m remote management of COVID-19 patients. Uh, so the strategy is to try and keep people um, in their homes. And then if an intervention is needed, um, if the oxygen saturation level drops below uh, 97%. So, um, our, our, well, actually, let me give you one other, one other demo. Um, so this also happened kind of in the, in the last hour or so. Um, we work and we work with a small company um, in the digital, another company in the digital hub, and we'll do try and do a, a live demo now. And what they have developed is a secure video link. So if a patient calls into the call center and needs a consultation, they're sent a link, and they click on that, and it, essentially it opens up a secure video link. Uh, to a clinician who can who can guide them. I'm just going to see if this will work. Hello, Donal. Hello, Martin. This is Donal Morris. How are you? Good, good. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, you're you're talking in front of uh, an audience here at the IIEA. Say, how's my COVID-19 symptoms going? Slight dry throat because I'm uh, presenting in front of a tough audience here. Okay, well, I think... Okay. It, great, Donald. Well, look, we'll, 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 we'll close it there, I think, but this is just an example of uh, the kind of innovations that we can you know, put in place that will help with uh, COVID-19. So you take the, our screening app, you take remote management of um, COVID using the oximeter and this kind of uh, video link capability and you actually get quite a quite a you know good response, and we'll hopefully we should be in good position to, to deal with the, with the coming wave. Okay, thank you, Donald. I'll talk to you later on. Thank you. All bye the best. Bye bye. So uh, we have a big challenge in Ireland, and we sort of took on the, the the metaphor of John F. Kennedy. So we choose to digitally transform our healthcare system, not because it e it's easy, but because it is hard. Um, what we want to, our, our vision is that Ireland could be a European digital health leader uh, within five years. We could be the company, the country that is best positioned to respond to COVID-19 because we're applying digital technologies. And our vision is that we could be a global digital health leader by 2030. And we're very blessed in Ireland. We have a digital health ecosystem, more than 200 uh, companies. And I want to give a couple of examples of the companies that uh, we're working with that can actually bring genuine transformation to the healthcare system. Uh, so this is a capability maturity framework, and I've already said in the OECD report actually clearly shows that we've got a very low digital capability. And what we want to do is jump 
two maturity layers to become a European leader by 2027, 2025 to 27. And we want to move healthcare from where it's perceived as a cost centre, where it be becomes an investment centre. So for Ronnie Downs, this would be a you know, remarkable you know, mind set that health isn't, or, or healthcare isn't expense, but there actually could be genuine uh, return on investment here. So when we talk about digital transformation, and digitization is a conversion of analog or physical information into a digital format. Digitalization is the use of digital technologies to enable or improve business processes or outcomes. But what we're talking about is digital transformation, coordinated digital change effort at scale throughout all aspects of the organization and the ecosystem. So driving one project isn't enough, 10 isn't enough, maybe 20 could actually move the needle for us. Uh, we're at a unique point in time where we have multiple disruptive technologies all showing up at the same time. In the past, whether it was the railroad, the internal combustion engine, it drove a great wave of change. But today we have cloud, we have machine learning and artificial intelligence, we have social media, uh, we have the Internet of Things, we have big data, blockchain is coming. And then the next big, the next big uh, thing, it's all adding up to a, a perfect storm. And we have a choice, we can either be overwhelmed uh, by all of these technologies or we can proactively respond and the choice we're making in the HSC is to be able to be proactively, uh, proactively respond and be an early adopter and uh, do, do disruptive things uh, based on uh, the technologies that are coming. Um, the CEO of Ericsson once said the pace of change will never be this slow again. I think that's particularly apt and, and, and true. So we're on a transformation journey from analog to digital healthcare and I, I think Donald is still dialed into, he's probably hearing the rest of the talk, let me just remove him. Okay. Uh, from analog to digital healthcare and from reactive to proactive healthcare, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, we're seeing the opportunity for digital health to actually bend the cost curve. We'll see that we can have a real-time health system. Obviously, Apple Watches and other capabilities have the ability to detect in real time the onset of atrial fibrillation, which I learned recently was also a big predictor for stroke. So if you have a watch and Huawei and other companies are also coming to the market with these kinds of capabilities that detect immediately you have a, an, a, an AFib problem, uh, you can really get things fixed in, in real time. So avoiding a, you know, the, 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 the cost, but particularly the... The, the difficulty of actually having a stroke. We're moving to where solutions are citizen-centered and, and more and more um, users are being brought into the innovation processes in companies to actually learn how to products will be used and influence the, the innovative features that are, are used on new products. And then we will get to a phase where there will be data-driven innovation and we'll be able to make large-scale public policy or uh, public health policy decisions based on data that we collect, based on consented data. Uh, so as part of our digital transformation, we have five vectors, and I want to talk you through these uh, five vectors. The first is our digital academy. So the UK have built a digital academy, and they have about 110 people uh, go through uh, um, a, a postgraduate diploma in, in digital health. Uh, we've made a decision to do something a little bit more expansive. The flagship of what we're doing is our Masters in Digital Health Transformation, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, in a second. But we're also creating a digital health passport. It's almost like a sheep dip. If anybody's working in digital health, they take this four-hour training, and it takes them from sort of level zero knowledge to level four, level five knowledge. Um, we're working with the Matter Hospital, and I'll mention that uh, briefly. But there are, there are other offerings, and this is basically a, a maturity uh, curve. But the key area where we're focusing on right now is creating the digital health leaders that will help drive the transformation that we need to embark on. Uh, last April, we pulled together all of the professors in the field of digital health, and we invited them to Maynooth University, and we actually co-designed a new curriculum uh, for digital health based on the best of what was available um, <coughs> in Ireland. That was last March, and we said we, want, we had a stretch goal of setting up in January. A lot of people said we were insane, but in middle December, we were able to actually hold the first induction for the students of this master's, and we have 50 uh, people um, in the class. Uh, 44 of them are from uh, the HSE and six others. Uh, we've recently been talking with Northern Ireland, and I think this master's is, is unique. 
in that it has every university in the country actually contributing, including D TUD. But we have a lot of interest, and Maurice O'Connor has facilitated this discussion uh, from Northern Ireland to create, make this an all-island uh, masters and you know have some of the teaching happening happen at UU and uh, Queen's. What's different about this master's, instead of actually having to write a, a um, 30,000 word dissertation, the students will be asked to take on a, um, a digital change master's. So we hope to have, our program project, I mean, excuse me. So we'll have 14 to 16 digital, simultaneous digital change projects uh, ongoing. We're just in the process of selecting the final uh, projects. Some of the ideas came from the students. Some of them came from top down. Some of them have come from the middle of the organization. So this will become the digital change, the primary digital change mechanism uh, <clears throat> for the HSC over the next couple of years. We have a collaboration with the, ma with the matter. I'll talk about what a living lab is in, in a minute, but uh, what we've been doing there, what the team have been doing there is surveying the nurses and the HEAs and looking at their digital skills proficiency. And then we're providing a response so that we can actually close any gaps. And we want to plan to use this as a, as, as a national uh, model. So we have some PhDs that are working on, on research. So from uh, feet on the street, through the masters, through the uh, research, uh, I think we'll hopefully build a formidable di digital capability. <clears throat> Our second pillar is open innovation. So open innovation was introduced into um, sort of uh, academia in 2003 when Henry Chesbro from uh, the University of California at Berkeley uh, wrote a famous uh, book on it. But we think we have to go beyond open innovation to something that we call open innovation 2.0 and Eric Topol has written an excellent book, The Creative Destruction of Medicine. So the creative destruction of Schumpeter, he talks about a new model of medicine as being induced by the digital era and the altered way in which information is flowing. I was privileged to lead some efforts with the European Commission over the last five or six years. And I, I authored a book with uh, Broer Salmon from GG Connect talking about this phenomenon. But essentially we have a new primordial soup where everybody is innovating together. We have large companies, small companies, universities, patients, parents, all innovating together. And if you look in Ireland, we actually have a remarkable uh, ecosystem of players with an interest in digital health. We have the universities, we have the large uh, tech companies, uh, we have a lot of the big pharma companies, and we also have a very vibrant startup community. So what we want to try and do is orchestrate this ecosystem. And we've come up with a concept we call stay left, shift left, which is a way of describing slaughter care in four words. What we want to do is first keep well people well in their homes through um, stuff like lifestyle education, nutrition, and so on. Or also, if I have a chronic condition, that I'm best managed um, in, in, in the home. So that's uh, stay left. And then shift left is about trying to move people from an acute setting to community setting to home setting as quickly as possible. And one example of a technology innovation there is the Da Vinci robot in Limerick. It takes an eight to 10 day colorectal um, resection procedure and turns it into a day and a half. So the patient is home in a day and a half and lo loses a lot, lot less blood. So this is an example of stay left, shift left. And we've already t started to work with the ecosystem and we have companies proactively coming to us uh, who are saying, well, here's how we're you know, helping somebody uh, stay left, shift left, you know, silver cloud. They do a lot of CBT for, um, uh, for mental illness uh, patients. Uh, Medics Note have come up with this is uh, you know getting quite a lot of adoption in the, in the UK and in, in Ireland, and is, is bot technology or it actually replaces WhatsApp. It's secure. It's a secure WhatsApp WhatsApp for clinicians. Uh, the third area that we're working on is digital labs, and um, as Joy said, I used to run Intel Labs Europe. So we're trying to take a similar approach and set up a network of labs, uh, digital labs for for the HSE. This is uh, Ross Cullen, actually a gentleman that developed the app I showed earlier. But we, we're tracking over 50 programs and projects that have capability to actually transform our healthcare system. And each project goes through four phases, research, pilot, demonstrator, and then ultimately broad adoption. And what we noticed is that actually our innovation process was broken in the HSE. We had a lot of SMEs coming to us, and even the large companies saying it's so hard to sell into the HSE, and they would be having a lot of international success. So what we're try trying to create is a unified pathway uh, to, to adoption. And um, what we want to move to is, is a network of living labs where we're testing 
uh, different technologies in different areas. So we have users, we have public actors, we have private actors, and we also have the universities involved. So just late last week, we turned on a living lab for something called vital signs automation. And I'll mention, uh, I'll tell you what that is in, in, in a slide or two. But what we've tried to do is create this new innovation pipeline. I was talking with Dermot Mulligan uh, earlier. So one of the sources of innovation in the system is the health innovation hubs. Uh, other sources are the Spark programs. We have internal processes. We have um, quality innovation corridor. But regardless of what the source is, we're trying to actually get everything uh, to come through this process. And you might get 50 ideas here. You know, 20 might graduate to here, and four or five get to here and get to, to broad adoption. So for the first time, we're trying to manage the innovation pipeline um, in, in the healthcare system. So we have a portfolio. And on the x-axis, we have benefits. And on the y-axis, it's the doability of a solution. So you might have a solution that has huge benefits, but it's not accomplishable because of infrastructure, because of spend. But what we really want to look at is the solutions that have lots of benefits and are also uh, doable. So I want to give you a, an example of a couple of those uh, technologies. So the first one is uh, vital signs automation. And essentially what this does, this is sort of a standard Welsh Allen a uh, piece of kit that takes blood pressure and temperature, et cetera, in the ward. And uh, we're working with a company from the west of Ireland that put a smart tablet onto that. And it basically automates um, the, uh, the collection of the data, but also the computation of something called the early warning score, the national early warning score. Uh, we, a pilot was run with this device um, uh, about a year and a half ago in a, a hospital in, in Leinster. Um, can anybody guess what the error rate on the National Learning Warning Score was? This is the score that is used to uh, track if a patient is deteriorating. Well, I won't say it and I won't ask you again, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't good. So what we can do with this kind of technology is you can eliminate the, the errors to zero. So there are no errors and the National Learning Warning Score can be used as a reliable source of actually uh, saying whether a patient needs further help or, or not. Uh, this same company have run an extensive pilot in Golden Jubilee uh, in, in Glasgow and uh, it is found to be very beneficial. And once the data is collected, it's displayed in a, 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 a new scoreboard like this that is in the Ward Central Station. And a little while ago, I was down in Bon Secours Hospital in Galway and they have this running uh, on a ward. I was talking to the ward manager and she, she said this isn't safer, it's just it's way safer and it's something we absolutely need to do. So what we see in terms of, we talk about what we call value dials, we're trying to come up with a consistent way of valuing business cases. So what we see in this case, the early warnings error rate goes to zero, escalations to ICU go down, the average length of stay goes down, staff productivity and nurses 1.6 times more productive using this kind of uh, approach, patient welfare, which is probably the most important thing, uh, goes up. So we can detect cardi unanticipated cardiac arrest or the likelihood of that happening. We can detect early onset of sepsis and so on. But well, perhaps one of the most interesting things is bed capacity goes up. So in Golden Jubilee in Glasgow, um, uh, the supplier saw the early war or the average length of stay go down from somewhere between 15% uh, to uh, to 35 percent and this directly translates into increased bed capacity so we just did a quick calculation and we looked at if we were to do this nationally you know maybe it cost 10 or 20 million but we would have four times as many beds uh, available as the the amount of people on on trolleys at the peak of the account so uh, of the count that happened sort of in February I think uh, so this is a, sort of a breakthrough technology and something I, you know, we're thinking seriously about how we could uh, roll this out nationally. Um, <clears throat> we have our Digital Academy Forum on Wednesday in the Digital Hub, and this is a small d device called a food marble, and it uh, is very powerful. What we see, characteristics of digital solutions, is that sometimes they're able to deliver capabilities that are one-tenth of the cost. This device is one one-hundredth of, of, the, of the cost. It's used for somebody that has a irritable bowel uh, syndrome, and it replaces a device that call, costs 15,000 euros in a hospital. This costs 169 euros, so it's about one one hundred of, of the cost. And it, it essentially allows somebody with IBS, they have a device in a connected app, and they can you know, log their meals, they can run a breath test, 
and then it actually gives them it gives them a score so from one to ten that represents the level of fer fermentation that's going on in the gut and uh, you can actually find your triggers, you know, cucumber triggers me or, or, or whatever. But this um, it really allows the trend of actually better self-management in the home. So once a year, the IBS sufferer might get to use this device in the hospital. Today, they can use it multiple times a day and come to the clinic with much better data than the, the clinician ever had. Um, this is another solution that we're working on. It's called, this is a, a Smart Sharps box. The product is called a, a Health Beacon and you can see the box here. Uh, when somebody's injecting themselves with a biolog biologic like Humira for rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the, we, we actually don't know how much of that uh, medicine is actually used, and we spend about 800 million on, on high-tech medicines a year. Uh, this box will actually remind the patient, today's the day you need to take your, your medicine. When the patient has injected themselves, they put the syringe into this lid here, a picture is taken, it goes up to IBM Watson, and the clinician can then see through a portal while well, this patient is taking their medication. What we've seen is that the adherence rates have gone from about 50% to about 70, 75%, which is actually a massive jump. I know that we have some pharma companies here, and that kind of level of adherence rate jump is, is kind of unheard of. So this is a technology, a solution that is part of the digital innovation portfolio. And uh, we're really pleased uh, one of the pharma companies um, AbbVie actually sponsored uh, the initial trial and about 3,000 patients in Ireland have a health beacon today. So it's one of the largest internet of medical things, pilots, uh, or living labs in the world. Here's a really simple technology, but it has massive benefits. It's mobile x-ray. So today if somebody falls in a nursing home or in their home, they have to get transferred to the hospital. They maybe wait four, six, eight hours to get an x-ray and then they have to be transported home. This basically reverses the flow as patient-centric and brings the x-ray machine uh, to the, the patient and reports are typically available within one to two hours. Hospital-grade x-rays. Uh, the company, Mobile Medical uh, Diagnostics, um, they have run a pilot of uh, about 90 people have used this service. The average patient age was 86%. But as a result of it, 85% of those people actually avoided a transfer to a, an ED. And the motivation of the founder, Mary Maloney, she actually experienced being waiting eight to 10 hours with both her father and mother in a hospital waiting for an x-ray. And she said, there has to be a better way. So this is another example of a simple technology, but if we deployed it, it would really lead to a digital transformation. Uh, our fourth vector is the Digital Academy Forum. So think of this as kind of TED Talks. Uh, for healthcare, it's about uh, socializing and sharing some of the leading thinking and practice uh, in the country and and and, and from abroad. Uh, we've been we've had some you know, Paul Reader, CEO, kicked it off. Michael Harty, who chaired the Oireachtas Committee on on Help, actually was a very passionate advocate of uh, open systems. And as a result of his intervention, actually, our, our Digital Academy Forum this week will talk about. Um, uh, electronic health records and we have people from from Slovenia coming over to talk about how the children's hospital in Slovenia uh, adopted an EHR. We have uh, people from the from the UK and people in, in Ireland. We've had um, an epilepsy EHR lighthouse uh, you know running for almost uh, you know 15 years and there's some tremendous learning from that from we'll hear from Colin Doherty is a doctor in uh, St. James's and we'll also, uh, Professor Tom Fahey, we have a, we're signing a collaboration agreement with the RCSI uh, around uh, open electronic uh, health record systems and looking at how we'll be able to integrate the, uh, the individual health um, identifier. Uh, we, last time round, uh, we actually focused on female digital leadership and it's remarkable how many digital female leaders there are in the health system and they're providing great momentum and impetus uh, to 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 us. This is uh, just as a, as an a, a example. Um, this is a lady from Chiron Medical, and they're using artificial intelligence for uh, breast check solutions. And this looks very promising. The trials that they're doing in in the UK. Our last factor is uh, focused on digitization, and uh, robotics process automation has become very hot. Uh, Robert Watt, um, who's who leads C Deeper. Uh, has um, you know, and the government actually made it has been a, a strong sponsor and driver of this. And government made a decision in December um, that we 
uh, every public service organisation should should be uh, adopting um, this. So this is from HSE, it's led by Lorraine Smith, who's at the back of the room. And we've been working very closely with uh, Deeper and Deloitte, who are the, the, the companies that were chosen on, on the framework, uh, to to look at how we can apply RPA in the, in, in the health service. So this is digitization of the health service. We held a symposium on RPA at the end of January. We've kicked off two pilots. One of them, for example, is Garda Vetting, and we have a backlog, backlog of about 40 candidate uh, projects that we can, we're going to tackle. So our next step is to, to run a boot camp uh, for HSE employees and, and tackle um, uh, different projects. And we're really pleased, very positive response from HSE employees wanting to get involved in this. And robotic process automation, what you're looking for is processes where an analog process that can be made digital, there's, it's rule-based, there's high volume, there's low variability, and it's error-prone. And when you have these characteristics, you get very good uh, RPA uh, solutions. And we'll be looking at four different areas for RPA in the health service. Patient access, which is hugely important, consultation and care, revenue cycle, and then finally, uh, supply chain. Uh, we're working, this is a maturity model from one of the, the key RPA vendors, but there's a maturity that model and a journey that we're going to go on. And right now, we're here in the health service, we're in the very early stages of adopting RPA, but we expect over a two to four year period, actually we can get a lot more mature and we'll be up kind of at uh, level five uh, maturity. I want to finish with two uh, quotes. Um, this is uh, a key quote from this Health in the 21st Century uh, report from Frances Francesca Colombo was one of the co-authors. The key barriers to building a 21st century health system are not technological. They are in the institutions, processes, and workflows forwards long before the digital era. And I think that's really true. And what I'm seeing, culture is hugely important. This report talks about culture. The way the HSE is responding to the current crisis you know, shows that actually people are very open to the adopt adoption of, of new solutions, and particularly in, in the interest of patients. So I'm, I'm very encouraged uh, by that. And the next slide kind of, I think, hopefully defines the response uh, of what the HSE is actually doing in, in response to the COVID-19 crisis from Winston Churchill. You make a living by what you get, you make a life by what you give. So let me stop there and thank you for your attention.